Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, hi. Hello. Wait, now, where's my stuff? Eh? Oh, wait, from. Oopsie. Okay, so as you can, oh wait, my name is Sheldon. I work at SP Digital. Yeah, so I do mostly front end, uh, mostly. And uh, today my talk, as you can guess, is about design tokens. So, anybody knows what is design tokens? Anybody heard of it? Sure or not? Never at all, man? Okay, so I think the makes sense that my first slide is, what is design tokens? Hey, wait, I actually got something to. I say, huh? I say, nah. That's my notes. Just in case. Okay, here. So what are design tokens? Uh, <clears throat> so let me start by something more familiar with that you're probably more familiar with SAS variables. So when I say SAS here, I'm talking about any CSS preprocessor. So like SCSS, less stylus, whatever your flavor is. But for the my convenience, I'm just gonna use SAS for the rest of this talk. So SAS variables, you know what they are, right? They came in the time when CSS had no custom properties. You define key value pairs. You store values in uh, keywords that you can use later. Uh, so you know what's that. So let me talk about what a typical project workflow is. So a designer typically creates a mockup in Sketch or Figma, passes the mockup to the front-end developer. And uh, the front-end developer, if you're lucky, the Sketch already has, the, the designer has probably made an artboard or a separate page with all the colors, all the font sizes there for you nicely. So if you're lucky, then you can just get the values up from there. Otherwise, you have to probably comb through all the different pages, identify what are the common properties that need to be extracted, and put them into a variables file like this. In any case, you get the variables file with all the list of uh, properties that we'll be using. And the designer, so you, the, the dev then goes and makes the, the website or the app. Then the designer then verifies that, verifies the work that's been done by looking at the end product in like a final uh, staging environment or something like that. And if something changes, uh, typically what the designer does is it updates the mockup file, passes the file over to the front end developer again, and the developer then updates the values in the variables file. And once again, the designer then verifies the changes by looking at the staging environment. So there are some uh, inefficiencies with this process, right? So can you imagine? If you're in a large web project with multiple technologies, so let's say you're using CSS, CSS and CSS at the same time. So you might think that this is not really, a, like this probably doesn't happen that often, right? So can you imagine if you're in a large company, your team is using SCSS, another team is using less or not just CSS custom properties, and they share a library that everyone has to use. So now you're going to, you have no choice, you're going to end up using both at the same time, and variables are just in two different files. And the JS part, uh, so can you imagine if let's say you're using React or something, if you are rendering SVGs in your, your React, and you want to put in the colors inside like the field property. And now these, now these colors are buried in the, like some CSS file somewhere, you can't really extract it out. So what happens is the dev then redefines the properties in another JS file somewhere. So now you have files over the, uh, variables over the place, and maybe you're thinking like this is very contrived, a very contrived scenario, maybe it's not realistic. Well, imagine if you're in a larger company and then there's web, there's iOS apps, there's Android apps, and of course, you want the design to be uh, consistent throughout all the platforms. And I don't, I, I'm not a mobile developer, so I don't really know what goes into these files, but I, I know the process enough that I think they, they do have like similar process, a similar workflow where the variables are stored somewhere. So now you have variables all over the place again. So this is where uh, design tokens come in, right? So I tried to find like the most succinct, concise explanation for design tokens, and I found it in Firefox and their photon design system. So it says a design token is an abstraction of a visual property, such as color, font, etc. And these values are language application agnostic. And once transformed and formatted, can be used on any platform. So I just highlighted these two words here, abstraction and agnostic. So they're kind of similar in meaning. Uh, but so you have extract variables, not tied to any language. 
not buried in a CSS or SSS file somewhere, but in a more agnostic data format. So typically like JSON or YAML. And this is like, it functions as a single source of truth. This one file can be transformed and exported to the various different formats, so like SAS variables, CSS custom properties, uh, Swift and whatever. And that makes it easier to maintain and scale a, a consistent visual system for UI design, UI development across any platform. So the main thing is like one source of truth, right? And I think more importantly, it kind of forms a bridge between designs and development. So it sits at the root of the design and dev process. So it kind of, it's where these kind of two roles overlap. It promotes a shared vocabulary. So the designer and devs, they look at the same document, they know what each other are talking about, they share the same language. And being a different format that's not like CSS or anything, like YAML, it's a more legible and more editable format for designers. So it kind of empowers non-developers to engage with the code. And finally, it facilitates this idea of a living documentation because this is one source of truth and if you change it, the idea is that you can propagate these changes throughout uh, the other platforms. You can automate this process. So it's less of like going to the code and manually changing hard-coded values and that's like a very tedious and error-prone uh, endeavor, right? So as you can imagine, if you work on design systems or if you are working on like any form of library where uh, the UI is being shared and everyone is using this for consistent UI uh, development, then design token kind of makes uh, pretty, it's pretty useful. It makes sense to use that. So let me change tag a bit. I want to talk about how I got to this position. Uh, so without going too in-depth into what I'm doing at uh, SP Digital, so we have a library in-house and it's using SCSS and other projects are already pulling in variables from this library. But I wanted to move, on, move it to CSS current properties for the next, for the next version. So <clears throat> I need to make it better compatible. I can't just expect everyone to just change to custom properties at one go, right? So I already know that I need to have CSS and SCSS variables. At the same time, JS frameworks have always needed a better way to retrieve these uh, variables. Like I mentioned just now, the, currently the, the variables are redefined in JS because it's just easier to pull it from JS rather than try to find it from the CSS files already. And also lately, the design team is pushing for better brand consistency across web and mobile. So actually at this point, I don't even care about the mobile stuff. I just, I'm just focused on web because I'm doing web. And the way I'm trying to solve that problem is I looked around and I saw, uh, I found this technique that Zendesk is using. So then Zendesk has this uh, thing called garden design system. And they're using post-CSS to do something similar. So post-CSS, right? I mean, you all have, I think we have used post-CSS before, uh, most of us, in, their builds, in the build step like Webpack or Gulp or Rollup. So normally what we do is we just get the, we just download the plugins, put it into the process and it just works, right? It just runs and the CSS gets put down to automatically. So did you know that CSS has an API, post-CSS has an API? Yeah, so I think this is only familiar if you're building post-CSS plugins, which I think most of us are not doing that. So post-CSS actually is a, it passes, you can pass your CSS and generate an abstract syntax tree. So it turns your CSS string into basically a tree format where it's like a DOM. You can navigate this structure and like transform the properties. So what Zendesk did, so they basically have like a JS file, many JS files with different like colors, fonts and all that. Important into one JS file, the index.js. They run it through this process, a build process where they use uh, post-CSS and process and to generate CSS, SCSS, just everything from there. So I tried to copy their code. I mean, not copy, but get inspired by the code. Got Apache license or something. Uh, so this is the main chunk of the thing. So the, in the brackets, is CSS now that's like a plugin that they just throw in at the start, so just, you can ignore it. Uh, pros, then process is the main function that's gonna be used. So this CSS part, so it's really weird because this post-CSS transforms CSS. So what they did was they imported the JavaScript, then in some separate process, they converted into CSS variables, like the CSS custom properties. And that concatenated string is then CSS is passed to here as a first argument. And uh, it's actually like a promise, so you get a result back. Yeah, so this is the result of that passing. 
And yeah, this, so this is what this is the destination that they are, the target that they're trying to aim. So JS, JSON, SCSS. The interesting part is here. So this result dot root and what rule. So basically, you can actually navigate this CSS structure using uh, JavaScript. So the rule actually is, uh, for example, the rule actually refers to this block. And if you have many blocks, then they're all different rules. And within each rule, you can you can walk the declaration. So a declaration is like one property, which is basically a key value pair. So you get declaration.prop, which is this, and declaration.value, which is this. That's when they do the transformation. So the camel case it, they uh, for the JS, and for the JSON, and for SCSS, you can see there's an extra dollar sign here for the SCSS value uh, variable. So what they get from there is this is this is below that next section, right? So they create the this folder, they concatenate all those strings, and they write it to the files. So you get from this, you get this. And I can just show you what happens next is basically what happens after all that processing. So they have all the variables in all the different formats. Uh, but so I tried doing that for uh, for my own project, and it worked a bit. It worked well enough, but it's kind of tedious and uh, error prone, and it feels like it feels hacky, right? Because there should be a better way to automate all these things, right? So I, this was supposed to be my talk for today. <laughs> then I last week I was looking around, then I discovered this thing, Style Dictionary by Amazon. So actually, this I'm just going to show you the web page for this. So this is a problem that they have kind of addressed. This is a tool that uh, you start with. Oops, where is it? Yeah, you can install it as a node module, and you have properties in JSON format. You have a config file somewhere, config.json, and then you can transform all this into whatever target that you want. So Android. SCSS or iOS. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, live copy and paste demo. Uh, yeah, of course. This is still new to me. Uh. Well, actually, I should do this. Right, so this is a blank project. And I'm starting with the variable. So what I do is I create a properties. Folder and I call it uh, color. And I create a base.json. I'm just going to copy and paste things I have already. Uh, see so, just some uh, like gray light, medium dark, and stuff like that. To start converting this, I need a config.json. And yeah, to start with, I just want to convert it into SCSS. And when I run it, you run the build command and it outputs ta da. So this, this, uh, Color base gray comes from this property hierarchy that you created here. So color base gray. So let's say I want Android now, right? I have an Android config that I just copy and pasted. Yeah, as you can see, so the, the way it works is SCSS here, Android here. Yeah, within each configuration, you can set the build path, the files you want it to output. So I actually only have colors now, no fonts yet. So I'm just going to delete this. Then front build again. Oops. Ah, damn. What do I do? Oh, comma. And I don't know Android, but apparently this is how it looks like in Android. 
and iOS has even a bigger chunk, so I'm just going to try it. Yeah. iOS has a lot of stuff. I actually got some font sizes here, so I didn't really build it, but let me just get it. <sighs> so let's say I want font sizes here. Size. Beautiful fonts. JSON. Yeah, just. So in CSS, this is going to be RAM. Uh. And if I just redo everything. Yep, iOS has all that random things that I don't know whether it's correct or not. But that's the way it is. Yeah, fonts here. Yeah, I missed out the Android configuration for four sizes, but yeah, so this problem has been solved. Don't try to do the Zendesk method. Uh, oops. Where is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's called Style Dictionary by Amazon, so it's legit. Uh, this is a library you can. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think you only probably like do this if you're doing design systems or like style guides. So, yeah, actually, this is most of it. I didn't have a summary slide, but yeah, design tokens, good for scaling across product platforms and use style dictionary. Uh, that's it. Any questions? The phone you're using, right? The code phone is operator mono, right? Yeah. <laughs> I got it from somebody. Okay. Can who is in this room? <laughs> 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 I'm just wondering if you paid two hundred dollars. Hmm. Yeah. Unless you never pay, huh? Don't need answer. Don't need answer. But okay, I know, yeah. Applause. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, today's edition is the unofficial SP edition, because my second speaker also for SP1. Yeah. Right, so, uh, talking about...